it's very important for us to understand that when we go into the divine liturgy, of course, you know, there's a liturgy of proscomedia, but the beginning that most people see is blessed is the kingdom, the Father and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And when we come to Christ, we're coming to his kingdom, we're coming to his renewal. And that, back to that, that image and likeness comes from him. To be truly human, I look at the God-man. That's why on the iconostas behind me, there's always Christ. You know, you have the, the, the holy doors, and you have Christ, and you have the Theotokos. Really two icons, you could say, of Christ, because the mother of God's holding him, and, and she is the Ark of the Covenant. You know, you still need the Ark of the Covenant. We have the animate Ark in the Orthodox Church. She bore she bore the heavenly bread. She bore the logos. Uh, she is the Ark of the Covenant. Um, but we have, we have them always, every Orthodox church, next to the holy doors. Why? Because that's the true humanity. What do I look like? What, what's my identity? My identity is Christ. That's why St. Paul tells us, he says, you have to lay aside, you know, paraphrasing, but the scriptures, you lay aside the mind of this world. And we have to be acquiring the mind of Christ. And that becomes our true identity. Why? Because man's, we want to become atomized and fractured and broken. That's part of the fall, that atomization. And it, you know, it's not, the answer isn't secular collectivization, right? You know, we have all these secular answers, communism versus, you know, democracy or whatever, you know, all of these things that are very man-made. It's all coming from, flowing from the brokenness and the sinfulness of humanity. Um, but the thing is, is when we become atomized down and we can become broken, fragmented, uh, and then we want to bring that back into the church, same thing. Um, when ultimately, ultimately, the church is, blessed is the kingdom. Blessed, it's not my kingdom. It's not anyone's kingdom. It's not, it's not a patriarch's kingdom. It's not a bishop's kingdom. It's not a priest's kingdom. It's not the people's kingdom, right? It's not a theologians, quote unquote, or a scholastics, because we really don't have theologians today much. We have scholastics. Um, it's not their kingdom. It's not, it doesn't belong to you. It doesn't belong to me. I become a part of it. God invites me into fellowship with him. Right? And that's where then I know myself, because I, in Christ I see who I'm truly supposed to be, because God, Christ is the cosmic man, as St. Maximus talks about. Right? He's the cosmic man. And to be truly human, then I have to enter into that divine man, that God man. Right? Um, and when we don't, when we don't, when we try to make the God man into something else, we kind of, it's kind of, you know, maybe it's like a Nestorian, we're Nestorianizing Christ. We just want him to be like us. Right? Well, he is. He had our nature. He, he, he came through everything except sin. Right? So there's that, there's that reality, but he's not. He's the God-man. That's why he's the only one that can save us. He's not just some guy. He's not just some teacher. He's, he is the God-man. He is the cosmic man, as it were. He is the one that transcends all of that, and my humanity in him right, does that. Now, I can fracture myself and atomize myself down on this fractured level of the modern existence and modern world, if I want to, and then I can demand that God recognize that as somehow my a legitimate existence, but it's not a legitimate, as it were, substantial existence. It's an insubstantial existence, right? Um, and it's things that we begin to, to hide behind, um, uh, and you know, that becomes the fig leaves for which we try to cover our own nakedness, right? Rather than saying we're naked, and the only thing that's gonna cover me is Christ, right? It's the only one. And instead of just falling at the feet of God in the Garden of Eden and repenting, we make up all kinds of excuses. You know, really, really, it's that the the the, the story in Genesis there is you know there's so much there's so much there it's amazing it's amazing but um, you know but it's a problem the problem is is there's always this temptation um, especially I think. You know, it's hard because you don't live in other times. All you can do is read about it in, t in books, you know, history. So it's hard to definitively say, um, but it seems like it's a very unique to our times. And especially, I think, one of the goals is to completely fracture humanity um, and to get us, us versus them, 
Now, of course, there's truth, and I have to uphold the truth. I, have to, I can't compromise that. I can't, I can't say, you know, it's, I mean, I can't say anything. Oh, you know, uh, in the sense of like, well, you know, I just like sleeping around with, I, I really dig women, you know, I'm a dude. What else do you expect from me? You know, and the church, well, that's just the way you are, you know, so that's okay. We don't do that. We call that man, you know, well, you have to use that energy rightly. Right? You have to use that rightly. There's a right way to use your human energy. Well, I'm just, the, I'm struggling with this, whatever it is, of course, the modern homosexuality or whatever other things. Well, that struggle doesn't define who you are. That's not who my, but we're identifying ourselves with our passions and our sins. Right? And that becomes the big thing, which Christianity calls us not to do that. Yes, I struggle with that. Maybe I really do struggle with homosexuality or alcoholism or, you know, um, fornication or whatever it might be, whatever these struggles are. And that's where we need the church. That's where we need Christ. But that struggle is not who I am as a person. Right? It's not who I am as a person. That is something I'm struggling through through the brokenness of my own humanity. Um, but we want to identify humanity with its brokenness. And, you know, we kind of touched on that in transhumanism and all of these things because man is always struggling with his own, to process his own brokenness. Right? Um, and then I think we're always being, the other temptation is we're, we're always, you know, there's this concerted effort um, just to keep people divided, us versus them, you know. You know, pick a side. You can't, it's like if you try to be, middle ground, which is, you know, not on dogmas, right? We're not talking about teachings of the church right now. I can't be middle ground about the ever virginity of the Mary. That's not up for discussion. You know, I cannot, I can't, it's not up for discussion. It's, it's, that's what we believe as Christians. She was ever virgin, um, and, and that's, that's revealed truth. So I can't, on revealed truth on dogma, no, it's not up for discussion. On, on the revealed morals, morals are part of the life of the church. It's not moralism. Right? But morals, the way I should live as a human, that's part of divine revelation because God knows how I should be living because he made me. Um, so on those levels, of course, we can't have a discussion. We can't. But on other things, we're talking about other things, so we'll bring it down. You, know, uh, you, know, you see in the world around us this, this concerted effort to, to always keep us at odds. You know, um, you know are, you, are you for Russia or... Ukraine, you know, which one? Tell me. And then you're like, well, you know, if you try to take them out, oh, well, you, you, you know, you, you're against all that, you know, all of a sudden you're, you're just hit with all kinds of labels. You know, you're a liberal. If you support anything, if you're like, well, you know, poor Ukraine, the people are being bombed. They're bad. You're such a liberal. You're such a, you know, how could you support NATO, demonic West, whatever stuff goes on, right? Oh, and then if you come out, well, uh, you know, I kind of lead towards, oh, you know, they're a bunch of fundamentalists, you know, whatever, you know, and they come up with all these other slurs. And we're constantly, instead of being able to talk to each other, right? Um, you know, just that's kind of an, in the Orthodox world especially, um, kind of an easy one, maybe even on the civil level, you know what I mean? You have, I don't have to hate Russia. I just don't have to. There's a lot of good people in Russia. You know, their national policy doesn't define who the people are. You know, just like, hopefully, as an American, the national policy that is being formulated in, in, in Washington doesn't define who I am as a person. God help me. I'm in this country. I pray for it. It's where God put me. And I'm going to labor here as best that I can. But, you know, I don't, it doesn't mean that I think everything Washington is doing is, is the latest, greatest thing. Nor do I think that the West is, you know, this great, this, the demonic Antichrist. It's ridiculous. The Antichrist, it's a spirit. It's a spirit, right? Guard our hearts from that Antichrist spirit. Yes, it will have a system. It will indisputably. But... I think we have to really defend because, you know, abortion, let's say, you know, there we go, I'll head on some. Abortion is part of the Antichrist. It's, it's, it's you know, terrible. People have abortions can repent, you know, but it's a terrible thing, right? All of these things, these are all part of that. And we see that struggle different, but in, in, in you know, in Russia too. Are they not struggling with the Antichrist spirit? They are. They're struggling with abortion, with divorce, with unfaithfulness. Just different. Well, think, okay, maybe they're 
from a conservative level. Uh, maybe I, you know, oh good, they're, they're kind of, they don't have this LGBTQ propaganda. They're, you know, Christian. But is Christianity conservatism? Right? No, it's not. Is Christianity liberalism? No, it's not. Christianity is blessed is the kingdom of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And when we make it conservatism or liberalism, we're doing it a great injustice. We have to see above that. We have to see above that. We have to see that the struggle in the, in the West, right, is a, a struggle that is permeating the world. Russia's not free from that struggle, you know, and sure we can, all these things, neither is Ukraine, right? But there's pockets, beautiful people struggling for the kingdom of heaven in Ukraine, in Russia, in America, you know, in, you know, probably, hopefully, around the world, on every continent. And that's why the world's still here. That's why the world's still here. Um, so I think this, this knee-jerk reaction we're always having, you know, of course, if it's a dogma of the church, yeah, I can't, yeah, let's, let's have a talk about this dogma. No, it's not up for, but on these other things, are we really going to let, are we really going to let this demonic, diabolical division afflict us as Christians. And if we do, which we are, which we are, then what hope there is there for the world? What hope there is the world? If as soon as someone shows sympathy for Ukraine, they're bashed as some kind of supporters of the Antichrist and the evil NATO West, right? And then someone says, well, I kind of agree with Russia. Is there not a freedom? Right? Do we not have a freedom? And do we have some dogmatic decree on what we have to support? No. And we can, can we say, I don't support either side, but I support the poor people that are suffering? I support the Orthodox Christians and the other people there that are struggling? You know, can't, can we not have a little bit of mercy? But when we harden our hearts, in the name of the gospel, something terrible is happening to us. Because of lawlessness, Christ warns us, He's talking not to the world. He's talking to Christians. Because in the last days, lawlessness will abound. The love of many will grow cold. And then, in the name of harshness, in the name of orthodoxy, we're going to beat each other up with no mercy to what's happening, with no mercy for the suffering people on all sides, you know, in Israel and in Palestine, right? But no, pick a side. Who are you? Oh, well, there's suffering people in Israel. Oh, you're a Zionist. You know, what do you support? Blah, 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 blah. You know, oh, you support those Palestinians or they're a bunch of terrorists, you know, X, Y, Z. And so there's no, we're completely shut down. The ability to truly meet, to truly meet. And these issues that are not dogmatic, they're not... They're very complicated, and they're open. They're open that we can say, okay, you know, let's have some Christian mercy. And, and I think that's one of, the, what, what's, one of the things that scares me the most, my limited you know, involvement online, is how harsh Christians are becoming. How harsh we're becoming. And that doesn't have anything to do with being liberal or conservative, right? Uh, and it doesn't mean we have to compromise truth. No, absolutely not. Um, I'm, I don't believe in ecumenism. I don't believe in, you know, questioning the faith. I don't believe in restructuring the moral standards of the church. I don't believe, you know, none of that. But, but in this world, you know, if God has shown us mercy, because here we are today, then can we not show mercy can we not show mercy? Can we not rise above the turmoil and the dialectics and the diabolical you know, op oppositions that are happening? And the other terrible thing is when we use orthodoxy as an excuse for that. You know? There's a point to make a stand. We stand for truth. We stand for all those things. But when it becomes somehow like, you know, you don't support this cause, Therefore, these are somehow questionably, you know, in your orthodoxy. Um, 
then there's something very, very you know, wrong there. When we're so, when you heart, well, that's just the way it is. They deserve what they're getting, you know. Um, you know, and I've heard that. I've heard that from people. Um, a very, very harsh. Maybe I'm a little oversensitive. Um, but but I, I think that really disturbs me. And then, you know, I think, well, if, if, I wasn't, if I wasn't orthodox, if I didn't taste and see, if I was looking in from the inside, uh, well, well, why would I want to be part of that, you know? Why would I want to be part of that? You know, they just beat each other up for what? You know, for what? Um, what's the point there? You know, you make one little wrong move, and then all of a sudden, you know, you're, you're, you, you know we're just beat up. You know, we could go back to the, the, the not very popular, but, you know, I think things that needs to be talked about. You know, COVID, what happened in COVID. And, you know, I, of course, I had, you know, I had my, my convictions in these things that happened. Um, but in the some sense, can we not, after that, all, you know, heal uh, and, you know, have a talk about it instead of entrenching on all it? Because that, that profits no one but the enemy. Once we all be, I build my little, you know, I'm for Russia camp, or I'm for this camp, I'm for this camp. I'm just participating in the fragmentation of this world. I'm for America, you know. Um, you know, how, how am I different from the world? And how am I showing a better way? Um, and sure, we can have difference of opinions. I can, you know, someone can lean more towards supporting Ukraine, and it doesn't compromise their orthodoxy. Someone can lean more towards supporting Russia, doesn't compromise their orthodoxy, you know, and to make that, you know, just taking a hot topic, to, to make that some standard as if, like, you know, um, is, is absolutely ridiculous, absolutely ridiculous. And then we become harsh and hard people when we just blast each other, blast each other, blast each other. Um, and, and you go, you're like, where, where's that? You know, where's that in, in the gospel? I don't see that in the gospel. I don't see that in the church. The saints stood for truth, you know. The saints were not for political. And, that's, and it's hard because modern age, you can't be like, well, you know, the other, I think, false thing is like, well, we don't want to get political. Well, politics isn't everything, you know. Technically, abortion is political, you know. That, that deals with morals. It deals with Christianity. That's why we address it, you know. All of this sexualization, you know, on its broad pornography, from pornography to the LGBTQ stuff, all of that, that's what I'm saying, uh, that's politicized, you know. So it's hard not to, you know. So when people are like, well, we don't want to get politic. Well, politics is in everything, so you, it's hard not to step on it, right? But what we, want, we don't want to do is the polarization of politicizing things, right? Um, and I think that's a great struggle right now. Um, so, you know, God help us. God help us in that struggle. But I, I think if we can, who's benefiting the most right now, um, for instance, you know, in orthodoxy between, you know, uh, would you, again, we'll just stay on the topic we brought, you know, Ukraine and, and Russia. Who's really benefiting the most? You know, the enemy, you know. Church, church relationships have been broken, you know. There's great distrust, there's great pain, there's great suffering. You know, there's, there's bitterness, there's anger on both sides, you know. And sure, we can look at it, we can say, I can understand, you know, um, both sides to some degree. Um, but really, ultimately, with the Christians, who's benefiting? Has it benefited the unity of Christ? Has it benefited, has the war brought unity? Has it brought Christian life? And any of those things? No, it hasn't. It's brought fracturing, it's brought, you know, bitterness, it's brought sorrow, it's brought all these things. Um, so I think we have to, in spite of that, then the, we have to, as Christians, we have to live that Christian life and rise above those things. Um, I mean, I have family, my wife's family, she's Ukrainian, you know, they're directly affected by it, you know. Should I be against Russia? Absolutely not. It's, they're not my enemy. There's no way you can tell me Russia's, you know, my, or some Russians, it's ridiculous. Um, and so, so we have to stop, I think, seeing that. Now, do I agree with all of the geopolitical decisions that Russia's making? No, I don't have to. Just like I don't have to with my own country. Do I agree with the Ukraine? No. The, the, the politics? I don't have to. But do I love the people there? Yes, because I've met them. You know, 
Uh, I know them, you know, and, and do I love, I'm, I'm most, I've been most fed, fed in my, my orthodoxy by kind of Russian writers, you know, St. Ignatius, St. Theophon, um, you know, Father Seraphim who came out of that, St. John Maximovich, all of them beautiful. Um, so, so I think we, you know, we have an opportunity as Christians, we have an opportunity to show the world a better way, the Christian way. But as soon as we start devolving into all of these little camps and fracturing, we're not serving anyone any good except for the devil. And then we are just growing cold with the lawlessness of the times. And I think that's one of a great, a great temptation right now, especially for Orthodox, you know, around the board, but it manifests itself uh, specifically in certain ways in Orthodoxy.